so meshing, uh, meshing is the process of creating nodes and elements to represent geometry. Um, so you can create a mesh uh, by starting with geometry, like a CAD model, or you can create a mesh from scratch. Um, this may not be applicable to SolidWorks, but you can create a, a mesh from scratch just drawing nodes and elements, just like you would draw shapes in CAD. Um, so there's a bunch of different programs I've used where I just wanted to draw, like I literally just created two nodes. I just put in an uh, XYZ dimension of, of two nodes, connected them, and that's an element. And I just tell it what the cross-sectional area is. And what you could also do in some software is you can create a long, a long one and then just say split this into 10 elements and it'll just make 10 elements for you. You can all, it's basically like catting in FEA. You can also, uh, do linear, you know, at radial elements, you know, you can do patterns, uh, you can copy and paste elements. And where that's useful is like, let's say you have a, we do this quite a bit where we have a fitting that has a, a certain bond area, right? So, so maybe you have a, uh, a panel that's like pretty long and you, and you draw, you have like an aluminum fitting and like a bond line, right? So you, you bonded this here. And you, you run some analysis and you find out, you know what, my bond line is not big enough. I don't have enough bond area, right? You go, okay, well, I could recat this, remesh it, whatever, or I'll just tell the element, uh, the final element model to copy, you know, these and paste it here. And now it thinks my bracket's this big. And you run that and you iterate in the finite element program until it says, okay, I started with a, a three inch long bracket and I needed a seven inch long bracket to get the, enough bond area. And now you just have to update your CAD once. So, well, so, again, it sucks if SOLIDWORKS doesn't let you do this. It might, I haven't used it enough to know, but just remember when you get to other, you, using other software, there's more powerful things you can do and not have to worry about changing your design, your CAD model until you're done iterating. <laughs> So, but for most of the time, you guys are going to start with geometry and you're going to turn that into a mesh. Um, so this is, this is what the CAD will look like. And then when you, we say mesh, you're, you're going to see just the elements. Um, and in this case, it's, it looks, you know, you see kind of the CAD under there, but really it's just the elements that you're seeing. Uh, and then in this case, this is what the elements will look like. So if you, you'd have to turn on the properties to actually see what you which you told the computer to assume for an area, if you're just typing in areas. Okay, so I have four slides on meshing because this, this can control your results um, quite a bit. So your mesh density will control how well the mesh you know, matches the actual model. Um, think of it like this, right? If you were trying to represent a circle, remember you're breaking that into small pieces, right? If you have a big mesh, you're gonna have this faceted circle, right? Because you have straight lines everywhere. So it's, you know, if you had one element, it would look like a triangle, right? Instead of a circle, right? So, but then as you get finer and finer, it starts to look, you know, from far away, it starts looking like a circle again, right? So that's, that's the difference between a coarse and a fine mesh, right? <clears throat> you remember, you're approximating the geometry when you mesh it. Oh, and this will control directly correlates to how accurate your results are gonna be. Um, remember, they interpolate between nodes. So if you have results that are not linear between loads, you're not going to get you know correct results. So for example, this is a this is a thermal uh, analysis. So this is a fin, right? Where you have a temperature here, and the temperature varies not linearly to the end of this fin. So this is the if you were to test it and measure every single point, you would see this kind of curve. Now when you do it, if you do a finite element model and you only have this many elements here. Then remember, they calc it's all calculated at the nodes. The elements they don't calculate anything over this area. It's it's just it's just linearly interpolating between the, the, the nodes. So you're going to run a prop, you're going to run FEA, and it's going to give you results at these nodes, and then it's going to interpolate. So instead of looking like this, you know you're you're seeing things like this, right? Now this is fine when you have something that actually is linear. But obviously around these curved areas, this, this is wrong. If I was to pull this data point, it would be, it would be different than this data, the actual, right? <laughs> so if you know what this looks like, you wanna make sure you have a denser mesh in these nonlinear areas. And it's okay to have a coarser mesh, you know, in linear areas, but 
just keep that in mind as far as how the, the program works is um, larger meshes can lead to uh, more inaccuracies. <laughs> okay, so this says mesh refinement. Um, so also remember that everything's calculated at the nodes, but there's elements that are sharing the node, right? And so elements might have different stiffnesses. You know, this it, it, as geometry changes, right? One there might be an, a node that has uh, an element with different stiffness and another element next to it. So what happens is they're arguing over what the stress should be at that node, right? He says, no, it should be deflecting this much because I'm not very stiff. And the other guy's, well, I'm stiff, so it shouldn't be deflecting that much. So what they do is they average out the stresses over all the elements that are touching it, and then they smooth it over. Um, so <clears throat> this is what it would look like. So most of the time you're gonna see this. You, you're gonna see this, and if you don't turn your mesh on, which by the way, you know, I always recommend having the mesh on when you look at your results. Like it might look nicer without the mesh, um, but it kind of gives you a better insight into what's going on, right? Like if this red was over one whole element, it'd probably be fine. But this red is, 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 over, is over a couple different elements. And if you take off the stress averaging, then you actually see what's happening. This, this element's saying, I don't have much stress. And this one's saying, I have a lot of stress. Right, so there's a transition happening here. Something's happening here, and your mesh is too coarse to to figure that out. And so when you see something like this, you would want to refine this, and you'd want to basically have elements inside this red. And so you you want the elements to be different. You want this to you know you can see how this single element goes from green to red. You rather have this one kind of green, this one a little bit yellow, this one a little bit red. You want the elements to kind of blend like that, not within one single element. Um, so you have to pay attention to that. Um, so finer mesh will lead to lesser discrepancies and elements arguing over what the nodal stress should be. Um, and so while you may not know where this happens, it'll definitely happen at, at load, where you put loads, where you put restraints, and at any sharp corners, right? Um, and then you can use mesh control to, to refine these areas. So. You don't want to just say, oh, you know, I need my mesh to be a third the size. So I'm going to just drag the cursor over and make my mesh everywhere a third denser or whatever, three times denser. You can pick the geometry in this region and tell it to have a higher, higher uh, density mesh in that area and let it transition to a, a, a coarser mesh where, you, you know, everything is blue. Everything's blue out here. It doesn't matter really the mesh size if the stress is the same throughout the, the rest of that part. Okay, so in general, you want to, you do want to start with a coarse mesh, just because it's gonna cost you a lot of time to, to run your first model and then figure out something's wrong anyway. So run a, run a quick coarse mesh. Um, you might get some errors, which might tell you right away. Um, okay, I might have sharp corners. I might have some weird geometry that the computer doesn't like doing a coarse mesh. Um, and instead of just dragging it to finer, you might want to put a mesh control, which is a feature in SolidWorks. On, on the region that you think is probably the, the trouble, trouble region. But start with the coarse mesh, uh, and then you, uh, you have to rerun it. If, you, if anyone's ever ran analysis once and used those results, it's wrong, right? It's potentially wrong. You need to find the convergence. So, so you run a coarse model, a coarse mesh, um, you get your results, then you make it a, a little finer, um, um, the thing that SolidWorks has a drag bar, so it's kind of hard to say what a little bit finer is, but you know, I would say 10% uh, denser or something like that. Um, and then look at your results again, and you gotta, you have to wait until it's converging, right? So if you're, you know, if you're looking at stresses, that's, you know, 30 KSI or something like that. On your first run, you see 30 KSI, then you see 38. You know, then you see 40, then you see 40.5, you're can probably converged, right? So um, I think I might have a number in here later, I don't know. But um, it's good to plot it out quickly in Excel and just kind of get the pattern. But if you're seeing 30, and then 40, and then 49, right? And then 58, and then 68, and something's going on. You have, you're not converging. Um, and so what that might be is that there's a force applied at a node like at a, if you have a solid mesh and you have a, a force on a single node, 
it's infinite amount of stress basically on that part. So you get finer and finer and finer, it, start, it starts just giving you runaway stresses basically. Um, Cause you're giving it smaller and smaller areas over and as the thing gets finer. So um, it might be uh, the way you apply the force. There might be a sharp corner. If you don't care about the corner, like I, I said earlier, you, you remove fillets. So that's gonna create sharp corners. And the reason you remove fillets by the way is so that when you do solid mesh, you don't, it's gonna have to put really fine mesh at the fillets, right? You have small radius. And so it's gonna screw up your mesh. You're gonna have weird transitions from large to small elements back to large. It's gonna add more elements than you need. So you wanna start without the fillets. And you know, if it's an I-beam and you have fillets in the corner, you know, on the inside corners, you're probably not worried about the I-beam failing there, right? You're probably looking at something in the web or something like that. So even if you get a high stress concentration there, you might be ignoring that completely because you just know that's not the failure mode of the I-beam. Um, but that might be a reason you're not converging. So if you do have an I-beam and um, you're, you're not converging because you're just looking at the max stress point. So if you have an I-beam, and we might actually see this in the case study. Uh, no, I'm going to run it live, so who knows what's going to happen. I'm going to do it live. Um, she yells for that. <laughs> uh, so if, if you're going to get like stress concentrations here, but you're expecting a failure to be somewhere, you know, at, somewhere in the web here. Um, so it's going to keep telling you this, this, this is not converging. It's going to get a higher and higher and higher stress. But maybe the stress where you expect the failure to be, let's just say for some reason it was here in this little section. Let's say this already converged, you know, five meshes ago. Then you're actually done, right? Because this is the area, you know, that, that you care about. So you can't just blindly like run it and just take the max stress because you have to understand if that's a real failure point or just a stress concentration. And uh, okay, if it was an area that you cared about, you go, you know what, I do think it might fail here. Then you either should leave the fillet in there if you know from the beginning, or if this made you think this might be a weak point, then put the fillet back in and suffer the consequence of doing a finer mesh and all the rest of that stuff. Okay, last thing on meshes. So if, if a mesh is distorted, right? Uh, so if, if the elements are distorted from their basic shape, you know, these ideal shapes, which I have, um, it has an ideal shape. Every time it changes from its ideal shape, you're gonna get less accurate results, okay? So you're gonna, if it has a weird aspect ratio, if it starts to skew, if it starts to taper, or if it has weird internal angles, um, it's gonna give you uh, uh, improper results. And like an extreme case, if this tapers so much that it's like a triangle, it actually artificially stiffens your structure. Because when it's like this, you know, there's no shear support, right? You get a parallel uh, effect here. But if you make it a triangle, then it actually tr thinks your model is stiffer. And you actually see this in, this in this example, right? So these are just elements. So this is a good element, right? It looks just like the ideal element down here. Um, and then, and I don't know how they we forced to do this, but it, this geometry shouldn't ever skew, but you could have some weird geometry that is trying to, to combine meshes and it's gonna start skewing. And, you know, this is the correct answer, let's just say. And now it's it's way off, right? I mean, that's a big that's a big difference, right? Um, and, and then down here, you get 0.16, right? I mean, you get, you get a huge reduction. And again, this looks like a stiffer structure when you mesh it like this, you know? If you didn't do this, the, the software tweaks the elements but you have to check for this and say, this doesn't look like a good element. <clears throat> um, and yeah, your results will vary quite a bit. And this is called, uh, they have things to, to quantify this. It's called the Jacobian value. Um, so you want to check this uh, if, if SOLIDWORKS does this. Um, most programs will give you Jacobian value where uh, a perfect one is 1.0. So like anything less than that is bad. Um, and SOLIDWORKS will check this, your mesh quality for you. Um, you can even view a plot of mesh qualities um, and you can get a summary report. So you should always do this. Um, by the way, this will, uh, this applies when you do solid meshing, right? Uh, when you do beam elements and stuff like that, this, this doesn't apply because it's not making 3D meshing, right? So.
Um, so you want to get at least 90% uh, of your elements with an aspect, aspect ratio less than three, okay? Um, and preferably nothing has an aspect, aspect ratio greater than 10. Um, that's kind of uh, a goal um, based on some research um, that you should shoot for. Um, and I'll show an example of this, at, um, I think in the case study. Oh, and then you can see it here. So you, you can do this check blindly, but you can also check your geometry, right? This is a good, this is good, right? You have, you have these ideal shapes that are turning and keeping their, keeping their shape. Or this one, maybe you had a mesh control here where you made this a lot denser for some reason. Or, and, and so now it's making a coarse mesh to a fine mesh and it's really skewing, screwing up your, your mesh uh, qu quality. Okay, um, you know, some downsides to the FEA, right? I mean, they're all, it's approximate solutions I talked about, right? I mean, you're approximating geometry, you're approximating displacements, right? So just remember, you're just getting a, a general approximation of, uh, of the results. Um, this is like the biggest problem with FEA is that valid results, I call it, you can, anyone can get results, but valid results, something that's useful for you as an engineer, that's close to correct, is highly dependent on user input and your interpretation, okay, of that. Just like I said with the I-beam, you, you might say that i is gonna fail because look at my stresses, but it's actually in that corner and it never fails at that corner in any test that you do. So it's your interpretation of the results that FEA is giving you. Um, as I mentioned when I started this, I kind of wasn't, I really wasn't joking. If you don't understand statics or strength of materials, you're not qualified to be running FEA, right? So uh, you might be able to learn how to click the buttons and do it, but you're not gonna be able to interpret it. You're not gonna be able to, to run it properly. Um, at least not as a student. If you somehow learn through work and you had some mentor showing you, then maybe, but most people in this room, if you haven't taken those classes, it's fine to start learning how to do the programming, but you need to understand these fundament a lot of these fundamentals first. Um, we talked about how it, it solves at the nodes and interpolates over the element size, so any, that, that's also uh, something to keep in mind. Poor quality mesh while having accurate results. You need to be really careful with fixed supports as well. Um, so it will, it will prevent the Poisson ratio effect, right? Um, and lead to singularities, right? So, you know, you have a beam and you fix, if you did a solid mesh of like a beam and you fix the bottom face, so all the nodes are now fixed and they can't move at all. And then you pull on this beam, well, it wants to shrink, right? Because of Poisson, you know, Poisson's ratio. So it won't let you do that. So you're gonna get even more stresses at the base. Um, but when you have like a beam element, that's not a problem because it's, it's, a, it's a node. Uh, it's not, you're not doing a whole surface and, and preventing it from doing that. So um, be careful when you do fix reports. I, I have a whole thing on boundary conditions. Most students that I see, most of the biggest errors I see is anywhere the, the part they're, they're doing analysis on touches something else, it's a fixed constraint. Like fix it, it's a fixed constraint, right? And that's, that's also fundamentally wrong. Uh, you'll get totally wrong answers that way. Um, and then you also can get pivot errors, um, even if you uh, have balanced forces. So if you have a simple, simply supported beam, for example, um, where you only have forces going down, if, if you don't constrain it like in and out, you know, where there's no loads, you're gonna get errors, right? Um, because it, it, just ha it just can't solve that because you need to have zero displacement in, you know, in those directions. Even though there's no force going in that direction, so you're gonna, you might get an error that says that, an excessive pivot uh, error or something like that. And that's because uh, you just didn't constrain it properly. Um, uh, oh, and then we, I didn't talk too much about nonlinearity, but um, I guess I was supposed to put that as a bullet point, but I have a chart for it. Um, yeah, remember, it's, it, it's a linear analysis. Unless you're choosing nonlinear, where it will take into account yielding and stuff like that, most of the time you're doing nonlinear. So, you know, you're gonna see, um, let's say you have a part that is yielding, the actual stress in that part is not that high because it starts to yield, right? So if, if it's on this curve, this last, you know, the, the nonlinear part of the curve, this is the actual stress you're gonna see in the part. But the FEA is gonna tell you the stress is way up here. 
because it doesn't know that it's yielding, right? It thinks it's it's still super stiff and that it's it's gonna take the stress all the way up to here. So you'll actually say this part's gonna fail because look, it's above, you know, it's above, it's, but actually it didn't fail because it, it just yielded, right? So keep that in mind is that this is, it's, it's linear. Um, 